In this session, we talk about the mathematical characterization of the fluidization process. Now let's look at the forces acting on a bed of solid particles when it's subjected to fluidization. Now consider a solid bed. Now similar to the case for an individual particle, the forces acting on the bed of particles are the same. Meaning we have three forces the external force which is the gravitational force the buoyancy force and the drag force now let's see how their formulation becomes when instead of a single particle we consider a bed of particles now as you have seen the external force of the gravitational force for the case of fluidization the external force is given by Gravitational force is given by this F equals mg. For m now, it will be the mass of the bed. So m equals the mass of the bed of particles. So now to define the mass of the bed of particles, we need to know the volume of particles in the bed. Now to define the volume of particles in the bed, we define something what is called this void volume. For a solid bed, the void volume is defined as the fraction of volume of the bed which is void. So by void really here it refers to fraction volume of the bed which is occupied by the fluid. So if we have the length of the bed to be L and the cross sectional area the bed to be S, so the volume of the entire bed is given by L times S. We know that the void fraction is the, sorry, this should be void fraction, which is defined as the fraction of volume, which is void, meaning for this case, fraction of volume, which is occupied by the fluid. So volume of the bed being LS will have the void volume to be LS times epsilon so that's definition of the void fraction and we'll have the solid volume to be ls times 1 minus epsilon the volume occupied by the fluid is epsilon so remaining is the solid so that's 1 minus epsilon gives the fraction volume occupied by the solid and that multiplied by the entire volume will give you the solid volume if this gives the solid volume we have the gravitational force given by ls 1 minus epsilon rho p g the same with the buoyancy force then buoyancy force is given by the volume of fluid displaced by the solid which is the same as the volume of the solid times rho of the fluid and g so in the force balance we have seen that the three forces act on the particles are the gravitational force, the buoyancy force and the drag force. So the drag force has a relation with the pressure drop. The pressure drop is caused because of the drag exerted by the fluid on the solid. So there is a direct relation between this drag force and the pressure drop. If you take the pressure drop for the entire solid bed, the equivalent force will give the total drag exerted on the solid particles by the fluid. So we'll have direct relation between the drag force and the pressure drop as Ft equals delta P times the area. So the delta P, you know, flow is in the upward direction. So the area perpendicular to the flow is S. And if you multiply this area by the pressure drop, you get the total drag force. Now, initially, if there is a low velocity of fluid, there is not enough drag. So the drag force cannot overcome the difference between the gravitational force and the buoyancy force. So the fluid does not move. Now, if you keep on increasing the fluid velocity, the drag force will increase. And at some point, the drag force will balance the difference between the gravitational force and the buoyancy force. And that's where fluidization takes place. 
And when it's fluidized, the fluid keeps on flowing through the bed at a constant velocity and this neat force becomes zero. So in that case, we have Fd to be Fe minus Fb. Now if we simply plug in those values over here, delta Ps will become Ls Or we get delta P, L times 1 minus epsilon, rho P minus rho G. So this is one of the formulation that we'll be using again many times. Now let's take a look at two scenarios. So if you have a bed, at two different velocity condition, bed has two different length L1 and L2. Now for both of these cases you will get the mass of the solid remains the same. So for this case mass of the solid will be given by L1 S 1 minus epsilon 1 rho p and for this case you will have L2 S 1 minus epsilon 2 rho p. Now you see here, length of the bed changes, the void fraction changes because particles moves away from one another, there is a more void volume there, so more void fraction there. However, for both cases the S are the same, so if you have this you get L1 times 1 minus epsilon 1 equals L2 times 1 minus epsilon 2. So what we have from here is that L times 1 minus epsilon, this is a constant. So if you take this to be the constant in here, you see the rho p and rho is already constant and g is a constant, so delta p becomes really a constant. That's why you have seen when the bed fluidized, if you keep on increasing the fluid velocity, the bed length increases. However, the delta P, that means the pressure drop or the pressure difference between the two ends of the fluidized bed, that remains constant. Here we will also use another formulation of this equation, which is given by delta P over L to be 1 minus epsilon rho P minus rho G. This is another formulation we will also be using. And from here, you see that another case we will take where We'll consider L1 over L2 becomes 1 over epsilon 2 over O minus epsilon 1. Now this formulation we'll be using for determining the length in some cases. Now we have seen for the fluidization process, the pressure drop can be obtained by the force balance. Also the pressure drop can be obtained by this mechanical energy balance equation which is for if you have a flow through a pipe you take two points one and two the mechanical energy balance equation Bernoulli's equation gives the relation between all of the energy components of the fluid for this two position one and two which is given by p1 over rho plus g z1 here is the p is the pressure at point one rho is the fluid density g is the gravitational acceleration z is the elevation of the point one plus alpha one v1 is squared over two minus hf but right. HF represents the friction loss. This gives P2 over rho plus G2 plus alpha 2 V2 square over 2. So the relation between two points for fluids flowing through a certain structure. Now for our fluid as bed, 
We can also think the same way where if we take this to be 0.1 and this to be 0.2, we can write the same energy balance equation for this case as well. Now we'll make some assumption here. The first one is that that the potential energy change negligible. So that's negligible compared to the frictional losses and other components. For the second case, we'll assume that the velocity remains the same at this 2n. Also like the velocity correction factor in the energy balance equation, they are the same. So we'll have alpha 1 equals alpha 2 and v1 equals v2. With all this, if you simply take these components out from the equation, we end up getting delta p over rho to the h. F. Now do remember that delta P we define here as the pressure drop, meaning at point 0.1 the, the pressure is high, the point 0.2 the pressure is low. So delta P is really P1 minus P2, not P2 minus P1. Now what is this frictional losses here? Now to do that we will assume that the flow of the fluid is through some narrow channels inside the bed which help us to assume the same mathematical characterization as flow through. So we'll consider these individual channels to be narrow pipes and we'll use the same expression for friction loss for flow through narrow pipes for this condition as well. Now for flow through pipes, we have a relation of HF which is given as 4F length of the pipe, diameter of the pipe. And the average velocity of the fluid through the pipe is square root of that divided by 2. Now this is for the length of the pipe and for the diameter of the pipe. Now here we need to consider that if we have a bed length to be L, the fluid may not flow in a straight line from point 1 to point 2. It will need to go through some tortuous path to reach from point 1 to point 2. So if the bed length is L, for our case, we'll have to take some factor of L. So that's one thing. Second thing is the D pipe. What's the diameter of the pipe for this case? So we need to consider these two. Now considering those two, will have an expression for HF to be 4F, where F is the friction factor. We'll take, for a pipe, it's taken as the length of the pipe for a straight pipe. Because the fluid needs to go through some tortuous path over here, some factors times the length of the bed. And then D pipe is daily for our case, where there is no diameter of the pipe here. So it's what is called this hydraulic radius. And we'll take v bar is square over 2, where v bar is the velocity of the fluid. Now, we will directly use the expression for this hydraulic radius, which is given by 2 over 3 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon y s d p. Also, we will relate this velocity of the fluid in the bed with the velocity of the fluid through the empty bed, meaning velocity of here, if this is dependent by V0 bar, we we'll relate that using V bar equals V0 bar over epsilon. Epsilon being a fraction, you see that velocity of the fluid through the bed is higher than the velocity of the empty bed volume. Also this is known as what is called this superficial velocity. So we have this formulation here. Now we'll consider the scenarios for laminar and turbulent flow. Now for laminar flow, there's a relation between F and Reynolds number. So F is given by 16 over Reynolds number. Where again Reynolds number is simply given as D V rho over mu. So for our case, we'll take 
dh v bar rho and v. Mm. Now plugging in this relation over here in this equation, we get hf 4 times f, f becomes 16 over re, which is given by this. So we'll have 4 16 over dh v bar rho over mu lambda l over dh d square over 2 which becomes 32 lambda mu v bar over dh square rho so if we replace dh by this we'll end up getting hf to be lambda mu l d naught bar over phi s dp squared rho 1 minus epsilon squared over epsilon q. Now we have this hf to be equal to delta p over rho and also experimental values suggest that this 72 lambda equals some value like 150. So if you simply use those relation and write delta p over rho here, this rho and rho will get cancelled and if we take simply l on the other side, you will get a relation for delta p over l to be 150 mu d naught bar over pi s dp squared 1 minus epsilon squared over epsilon cube. So this is for laminar flow. Now let's look at the relation for the turbulent flow. Now the same equation is valid. However, the expression for F that we used for the laminar flow is not valid anymore. However, if we plug in the values for the other terms, we'll get hf to be 4f we have lambda l replace this dh with the with its expression so that's 2 over 3 epsilon over 1 minus epsilon phi s dp and replace this squared over 2 so as this hf is equals delta p over rho we get delta p over rho to be just simply simplify this 3f lambda l d naught bar squared over phi s dp 1 minus epsilon over epsilon q now from experimental results we get this value for 3 lambda this to be close to something 1.75. So we plug in this value over here and just get delta p on this side. We'll end up getting delta p over L 1.75 rho goes there rho v naught bar squared over phi s dp. 1 minus epsilon over epsilon q. So this is the expression for pressure drop to a fluidized bed for turbulent flow. And this equation is known as this barkey plummer equation. We did the force balance in the bed from the resulting forces, namely the gravitational force the buoyancy force and the drag force, we got this relation. Next for the laminar flow, we again have the pressure drop relation that we got from the mechanical energy balance equation. Here we assume that the flow through the solid bed can be considered to be flow through narrow channels, which is equivalent to considering flow through a pipe. We saw that for this laminar flow, we got this equation, which is called this cogeny karman equation. And for turbulent flow, we found another equation, which is called this barkey plummer equation. Now this 
Laminar flow for a fluidized bed is considered when the Reynolds number is less than 1. And typically for very small particles, this laminar flow is attained. For turbulent flow, we consider when the Reynolds number is beyond 1000. That's when it's considered turbulent flow. So for large particle, typically this turbulent flow takes place. Now for the transition in between this range it's assumed that both the viscous losses and the kinetic losses take place and also those are additive so in the transition region we get the del p over l equal to the term for the viscous loss or the term for the kinetic loss and again that equals the equation over here so we get this relation and finally just doing a simple rearrangement where one mass epsilon is cancelled from here and one of this term we get this equation for this transition range where these are two components the viscous component and the kinetic component so if the flow is laminar we have this relation if the flow is turbulent we have this relation in the transition we have this relation for fluidization and this equation is what is called this argon equation do remember in this equation the viscous loss the viscosity term is there and for the kinetic loss part this density term is there few things about the some application issues for example you see here for laminar flow the delta p is inversely proportional to dp squared meaning that as dp becomes less and less delta p increases and increases now as you say that one of the purpose of using a fluidized bed is to enhance heat and mass transfer and for that enhancement we need more and more area however to get more and more area you need to reduce the size of the particles however you see that if you reduce the size of the particles delta p increases with the inverse of dp squared so there should be a balance between what you want in terms of the area and what you can tolerate in terms of the pressure drop this argon equation is the general equation for fluidization that covers the transition rates do remember that if the flow is laminar it should is only the laminar term because the kinetic term is not there and if we add this the calculations will be erroneous on the other hand if the flow is turbulent the viscous loss should not be there and if we add that that will be erroneous.